Hi there, it's me, Beverly Carrington, a 911 dispatcher from the OEMC. And today, I'm here to give you some information on a valuable resource available to all residents, Smart 911. Smart 911 is a free online service that allows you to create a custom 911 safety profile for you and your family. The profile can include as little or as much information as needed about themselves and their families. The profile can be linked to any number of addresses you may frequent, such as home or work, as well as any phone numbers you wish to add. This information will be shown only to 911 call takers when you call 911. Pertinent information will be shared with first responders as needed. Because over 75% of 911 calls come from cell phones, no exact location is available. By registering addresses you frequent, first responders may easily be able to locate you during an emergency. Your profile travels with you. When a call is made from a phone registered with Smart 911, if that municipality also has Smart 911, they will recognize the phone number and display the information that was provided by the registered caller. Currently, over 32 million people use Smart 911 for personal and family preparedness in communities nationwide. There have been statewide implementations of this program in places like Michigan and Delaware and Arkansas, but Chicago gets the award for being the nation's largest single user of Smart 911. Some of the information that can be included in the Smart 911 profile can include members of your household, along with the photo. You can also connect other members as well. So if you take care of a parent or visit a friend quite often, you can connect that information to your profile. Address details such as how to access your home, bail codes, or utility shutoff locations. Pets or service animals, including their names and vet information. Vehicle information like the color, the make, model, and plate number emergency contact information, and all medical information including medications or no medical conditions such as dementia, autism, or Alzheimer's. If someone has a known mental health issue, you can update with pertinent information like the doctor's location, the medicine someone takes, or if there are any triggers we should be aware of when responding to a crisis such as sensitivity to sirens, or flashing lights. This is important information as CPD has a crisis intervention team to respond specifically for emergencies where there may be a mental health component. Information related to a domestic violence incident such as offender descriptions or violation of orders of protection. And last but not least, COVID-19 status such as vaccination records. Remember, Smart 911 is secure. Call takers and emergency personnel can only see a profile when the resident makes a 911 call. This information is only made available once it has been verified through Smart 911. All the data collected is encrypted at every level and is not shareable by call takers. This information in your profile remains on screen only during the 911 call. This service also has a chat feature for mobile cell phones for residents unable to communicate verbally. The call taker can initiate a two-way chat feature only after a call to 911 has been placed by the resident. The caller cannot text 911 first. This feature is something that can be used by callers with hearing or speech impairments. A deaf or hard of hearing person can indicate in their Smart 911 profile that they are deaf or hard of hearing and that the preferred method of communication is a text message. When callers dial 911, the call taker will receive a notification to communicate via text. In addition to a nonverbal caller, if someone has a poor cell phone connection during the 911 call, the call taker can then via text, get more information or verify if it, if it was an accidental call. I've seen the call taker use the texting service to get information from a victim of domestic violence. Once the offender went to sleep, the call taker was able to verify the location, get a description of the offender, and when the police arrived on scene, she told her to go outside. The newest 
feature available in Smart 911 allows residents to opt in to share footage from home surveillance cameras with the Chicago Police Department in the event a crime occurs in the area nearby. By simply opting in on an existing Smart 911 profile or by creating a new profile, residents can volunteer to share home surveillance camera footage and allow the Chicago Police Department to contact them in the event of a crime. All Smart 911 profiles are private and are not shared. Opting into this feature does not authorize anyone to access your home's camera without your awareness. Additionally, Smart 911 users may opt out of this feature at any time. Residents can add this to their existing safety profile by logging into their Smart 911 account. A caller's information will remain in Smart 911 until the account is deleted. However, you must log in at least once every six months in order to keep your account active. Reminders will be sent to continue your profile. If the account does not show activity by way of logging in for a period over six months, the safety profile may be suspended until it's updated. This ensures all the information the call takers see is accurate and up to date. Why is joining Smart 911 the right thing to do? It saves time when seconds count. It's a free, voluntary, secure service that allows individuals and families to provide personal, medical, or situational information when they call 911 to help first responders rapidly assist in the case of an emergency. It helps first responders locate you because most 911 calls are made from cell phones today and by providing home address in the profile, the call taker can possibly better verify the location of the incident, which is critical when the time is of the essence. It gives first responders information to better assist you. In COVID times, by including vaccination data and other household information, the first responder can know vital information prior to arrival. Seniors or those living alone can have a peace of mind that in the event of an emergency, 911 will have the details on their home and medical needs. For loved ones living with Alzheimer's or other critical health matters, information can be added along with an emergency contact. For those who have physical disability or mobile restriction, it is vital for first responders to know about the disability and what type of assistance or special equipment they may need to evacuate their home or receive transport. You can save your pet or service animal. This information can assist firefighters in their search to bring everyone, including your pets, to safety. Now, go download the app or go online at smart911.com to create your profile because every second counts in an emergency. OEMC issues emergency notifications that you can opt in to receive. These are messages that give emergency alerts via text or email when there are things like severe weather, hazardous material incidents, major traffic disruptions, or other public safety incidents. By signing up for Notify Chicago at notifychicago.org, you'll receive general alerts impacting traffic or crowds in the area like special events, concerts, sporting events, public safety drills and exercises, and COVID-19 updates. And now I'd like to introduce Glenn Brooks, Director of the Office of Community Policing, to tell you more ways in which you can get involved and be proactive in helping your community stay safe and well. Thank you, Beverly. Thank you for inviting me today. Well, let's get started okay. by telling people about community policing and how it helps Chicago residents. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So community policing, most people uh, in the city, if you've been here for a while, mm -hmm. knew it as CAPS. Mm -hmm. And CAPS was a revolutionary way that police departments connected with community 
all over well, in Chicago. Um, and it was really the leader in making that connection with our beat meetings and meeting on a regular basis with community where we could have conversations about their concerns and more importantly, problem solving and what we could do to community building. I have a good question that's a follow up to that. What is the purpose of a beat meeting? How can one person find out where they live and when their beat meetings happen? Two great questions. First of all, let's talk about where you can find out. Okay. okay. So in the city of Chicago, we are blessed with 311. Yes, we are. You can call 311 and they will let you know where you live, what beat you live in, what mm -hmm. district, and what okay. time your meeting is. That's one way. Second way, you can go to Chicago Police Department's website. Okay. And we are also there under community policing or CAPS. Uh, those are two ways. And third, you can always call your district if you know which district and speak to your CAPS office, community policing office, and they'll tell you when that meeting is. And that's just one meeting. Now, what is the purpose of a, a, a beat meeting? That's an excellent. So here is where you have an opportunity to meet the local beat officer. This is where you have the opportunity to talk about the problems and concerns you see. But this is the most important part of it. This is the opportunity where we get to work together. A lot of these issues aren't simply going to be issues which can be resolved by a police officer and simply making an arrest. This is going to involve us working with our sister agencies. This is going to involve neighbors to resolve those systemic long-term problems. Five guys hanging, hanging out in the corner might be more than just the police going there. It might involve some social service, giving those people, young people, other things to do. It might simply be looking at what the park district does and making sure those opportunities are presented and letting people know like, hey, guess what? Park district offers scholarships to do their programming. So this is, we have to really look at a solution that is gonna be sustainable long-term and helps to build up the community and not just lock somebody up. So I've heard of the district advisory committee or a court advocate. Yes. What, what are those and can people yep. be involved in that as well? A absolutely. Okay. So a, a couple things here. We have multiple ways which we can touch and get involved with the community and community can get involved with us. So the district advisory uh, committee, that is a body which is made up of representative and stakeholders from the entire district that advises the commander. Uh, they meet on a monthly basis, but they kind of look at the district from a holistic viewpoint versus a district which is really kind of concentrating on your, your beats. Uh, the district advisory uh, level is a great level to get in, particularly if you're an institution, business, or you're very civically engaged. I will tell you, I began as a beat facilitator. Then I became a DAC member, and then I became a DAC chair, and then I end up working here. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. And there's also the court advocacy program. Is that something that people can get involved in too? Yep. If you're interested in going to court, so there are going to be people who are, are, have been arrested, who have caused harm to the community, and sometimes it's important to have those community residents in the court so the court can see how it's affecting the community. And those residents, they go to both the branch courts and they also go out to the uh, 26 and Cal. Um, and we assist them going to those courts, keeping them updated on court cases. It's really important, and another aspect which we, we uh, doesn't get as much light, but is probably more impactful, is when we go to hearings, mm -hmm. whether that be a business licensing hearing, whether that be a building hearing, where we can have a greater impact on those things that are causing harm or and tend to be somewhat chronic. Yeah, I can understand that because if it's a store right up the street from me, then I might want to be a part of the hearing that's referencing that store. I Absolutely. completely understand that. Yeah. So, do the CAPS offices work with seniors? Absolutely, we do. What are some so, of those programs that you all have for the seniors? So seniors, there, there are what we call some standing committees. Mm -hmm. One of them is youth, one of them is seniors, one is court advocacy. Uh, and another is what we call peer jury. Seniors, we have a special place in our heart for. Seniors, we have what we call our ID bracelet program, so that if a senior finds themselves in a position where they can't communicate, their ID bracelet will give them medical information to those who need it. 
We work with our seniors in order to do a lot of community buildings. We do outings with our seniors to keep them engaged. So seniors have a special place when we reach out to them, and particularly because we know some people like to prey on seniors, so we like to get them a lot of information. Yes, as much information as we can, because we want to keep them safe, because we all love the seniors. Okay, 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 okay. So there's something else that's happening, and that could be domestic violence, yeah. right? And this can have an impact socially that goes well beyond just the safety, public safety aspect. Um, it can negatively impact areas of life that can negatively affect the community. So what are those programs that the CAP offices has uh, that can help the victims? that are victims yeah. of domestic violence. So one is the victims of domestic violence. So we have a, a domestic violence liaison officer attached to each of the district office, offices, which do follow up when people call for service. They will call back, check in with the victim, make sure to connect those victims with services as they begin the next chapter of their life. We also have other civilian domestic advocates who accompany those individuals to court and kind of walk them and hold them and support them through that process. Additionally, we have what we call the Domestic um, Violence Subcommittee, and that is a group of people who are very concerned about this issue and look for ways to get information out to the community at large and engage around domestic violence. Domestic violence and gender-based violence is, is, a, is a focus of not only the CAPS office, but the department. And we're looking to expand it. We have rec recently received a number of grants regarding this. Uh, and we've been working with advocacy groups and uh, throughout the city in order to help uh, mitigate this problem. Okay, that, that sounds great. That's a great direction to go in because we want to keep as many people safe as possible. That's the goal. Yeah. Um, so you spoke about the youth earlier because we want to keep the youth safe. This is one of the utmost important things, especially me, a mom of two small ones, right? Mm -hmm. um, what are the initiatives, some of the initiatives that have been implemented by the CAPS offices to assist in giving our youth some alternative strategies in growing up? So let's talk about that. In terms of youth, this superintendent, Superintendent Brown, is committed. He, one of the first things he, he did was to charge us to institute what we call PALS. It's the Police, Police Athletic League. Okay. Uh, we are, we're going to be kicking that off this summer with a series of camps around baseball and softball and parks throughout the city. This fall, we're looking at expanding it into flag football. From there, we have partnered with the NHL, looking at expanding it in terms of hockey. But here's where the, the soup has really kind of put his unique spin on it. We're going to be expanding into the arts, oh, yes. whether that is drama, whether that is more of your traditional arts. We realize every kid isn't an it doesn't want to be an athlete. There's other talents and gifts that the world has to offer and the young people have to offer, and we want to find ways where we can engage with them. The other significant thing that we've done for, for PALS is really to dedicate manpower. Mm -hmm. So that has always been a challenge. How do we balance the two where we can offer an officer or a member of department you know, one day a week to, to really engage the young people? And we really want to engage young people around policy. Young people often ask, you know, what is your use of force policy? Why can an officer arrest me? Or one can an officer touch me? Does I, you know, all these kind of questions. We really want to engage young people and make sure they have the information for not only for them to be safe, but so they really do understand their rights and their responsibilities. Yes, I am especially excited about that. Especially, I have two little people, lots of programs, and the arts. That is really awesome because being able to focus in other kind of avenues for children, I know plenty of people who needed the arts when they were young. Absolutely. And it helped them so much. So um, this is something that's really important to me because I love my block club, mm -hmm. but I know the CAPS offices work with block clubs. Um, how do they work together to keep the community safe when you have those block clubs? So first of all, we have community organizers in all of our districts, and actually mm -hmm. we're hiring community organizers to ensure that we have one, at minimum one per district. They help blocks that have don't have block clubs to organize block clubs mm -hmm. or block clubs that kind of you know mrs jones was there and she ran it for 50 years mm -hmm. and then mrs jones decided to move to florida but no one took over so we help try to reinvigorate those block clubs the second thing we do is really help to bring other city agencies to those block clubs 
in order for them to understand what services that are out there. And I guess the third thing we really do is make sure that they have a connection with their local beat officers in that district. But just as important, what we can do to help build up those communities. Yeah. So, you know, everybody wants to talk what's wrong with a community. We also want to talk and support what's right about the community. There's a lot of right things in all of our neighborhoods. There are. There's tons of, I know my block club has been in existence and I've been in this area for forever. So I am very familiar with what block clubs can do. Um, we speak to one another all the time. We interact with one another. When they are cleaning the street, we will go get our neighbor to make sure you move your car. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so those little things those really little count. Thing, yeah, I know, right? So I am an advocate. I love block clubs. So good job, good job, good job. So I have some other things. Okay. Are you ready for this one? I'll try. Okay. In my area, mm -hmm. right, I've seen the CAFS offices do a plethora of things with community groups, as you mentioned. Um, they have things like the neighborhood cleanup uh, events, uh, resource events. Um, are there other kind of really neighborhood safety things that the CAPS offices will do with the neighborhoods within the city of Chicago? Yes, first of all, mm -hmm. we tried to divide our engagements in kind of four kind of big buckets. Mm -hmm. Number one is what we call informational. Mm -hmm. That's when we can do things that give you prevention tips. That's when you sign up for Twitter or you follow us on Facebook so that you're getting the information that we have that we can share. But we also want information back. I'm not just talking about information about crimes, mm -hmm. but other information. How can we support your block club? What are the young people that are doing? So we love it like when a neighborhood has a championship team. How can we help celebrate and hold them up? Because that's really important, all right? So that's our informational. Our second big thing is discussions. You're gonna see a lot of this about talking about what we as a group can do to make our neighborhoods safer. We're also gonna talk about policy, which is really new like the foot chase policy, about search warrant policy. So people have a, not only a clear understanding, but they are able to share their opinion and what they want in a policy. All right, so then the next thing up we do is what we call participation. And those happen in two different ways, community building type of uh, engagements and problem solving. So community building, that could be that cleanup, that could be planting the garden, that could be participating in a youth league. Those are all the things that make a community. So we come home to work and you know what we want? We want the things that everybody else has and so we will work with our communities and participate in that. The other side of it is how do we solve our problems? Mm -hmm. You know, the classic is that liquor store that or that building with those people who live there who keep having these large parties in the middle of the night and clogging up the street. How can we work to mitigate that? You know, we're not gonna be able to solve all of these problems. Many of these problems started well before any of us even lived in these communities and they've been kind of systemic. But what we can do is consistently chip away until we finally mitigate it and that problem is resolved. There is the four big buckets that we really want to concentrate our engagement around. So I totally understand that. Um, being able to give the block information, different avenues of getting the information, being able to give people the information in different ways or getting information from the people, uh, figuring out ways to give the community the resources to solve the problems that they may mm -hmm. see happening. That's, that's, that's a good direction yeah. to go in. Okay, so um, I've heard about this expanded anti-violence initiative so that was evie oh. even e that's what the it stand for <laughs> okay okay uh that has really evolved okay uh you know the mayor has really taken on what we call the whole of government approach mm -hmm. where we regularly sit down i regularly sit down actually four times a week mm -hmm. i sit down with um, most of the commissioners and we talk about how we can help address those issues that come out of beat meetings that have been identified by the camera, how we can really problem solve around those. Um, so, you know, every Friday we have what we call an operation clean where I bring all the departments together. We go to a specific area. It might be four by four, six by six blocks, and we deliver every city service we can to mitigate those problems, to really clean up the neighborhood and you know the old broken window theory. So better yet than broken window theory, 
you knew when you walked down the block, you didn't throw paper on somebody's lawn. Matter of fact, you didn't walk on somebody's lawn. No, I still but don't. we right, but we know how that contributes to the positive and the safety of a neighborhood. So that's what we try to do every single Friday. Mm -hmm. And that whole of government approach extends to on multiple levels. Mm -hmm. We're focusing on the 15 beats that have traditionally had some of the highest violence. Mm -hmm. We are also using the whole of government approach to deal with other issues that have come out, whether it's civil unrest, whether it is those systemic problems. It's not just the police, mm -hmm. it's those other agencies, yes. and it's including outreach workers, it's including community-based organizations, it's including the churches, it's including those block clubs. It is an inclusive strategy where we try to get everybody to have a role. Everybody's not necessarily responsible for solving everything, mm -hmm. but there's a role and there's a place for everybody there. Okay, yes, that, that yeah, again, these are good directions I feel like we can go inside of to get the community to work together to create safer places. Yeah. So the last but not least, and you, okay. you've mentioned this a couple of times, um, we've been hearing a lot about police reform and the consent decree. Right. So can you explain what all that means and how it can help the community? All right. Mm -hmm. So the consent decree is an agreement between the city of Chicago, its police department and the attorney general. And it's a relatively extensive consent decree. There's 660 plus paragraphs all right, um, that cover everything from community policing to use of force to um, what we call spanning control, how many officers to a supervisor, mm -hmm. to internal affairs. It's a wide range. What it's really designed to do is to make us a, a better department. And we meet on a regular basis in order to try to fulfill those. Now it's important to understand a couple things about the consent decree. Mm -hmm. it, isn't, it isn't just a one-time thing. Okay. There's three levels of compliance, right? So the first level is policy. We got to say, are, are the rules that govern our actions in alliance with the values of the city and the consent decree? There, we're making sure that occurs. The second thing you got to do is you got to train everybody up there. All right. Now, here's the third one, and this is the, the big one are we actually doing? And that's called operational and where we're being evaluated. So this is a really extensive process. This is gonna take several years. We're making progress. And I can tell you, Superintendent Brown has pushed us like none other. Mm -hmm. um, and we are, we are moving forward. Um, and this is going to make a better department. It's gonna help make us a safer city. And I, I will tell you this, this isn't just about what the police department is doing. It's what the city is doing and how we're interacting with our with, with, with the residents of this city. How are they giving us feedback on what the department is? So this is a, a collaborative effort, and we're looking forward to getting through this. Yeah, because we, we do. We want to find different ways, maybe a change of mindset, to get the different policing strategies that can be effective to the community. Absolutely. So thank you. That's what we're trying to do. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so, okay, everyone, right, see bye. y'all soon. Hey, see you at your next beat meeting. Yes, at your next beat meeting, because then I'll talk to you about signing up for Smart 911. Yep. <laughs> Have a good day. Okay. All right, bye-bye.